Happy New Year. I don't get to see all of the parishes at New Year, so this is close enough. Sometimes we might wonder how Jesus prays or what his prayer is like. What is his experience at prayer like? And this morning we get that little window, that little glimpse of the power of the Lord's ordinary prayer. He's praying and then from heaven the voice of God comes to him. And the voice of God says something that Jesus already knows, but no, no doubt he delights in hearing, you are my beloved son. So then we might ask, when we pray, do we hear that? Do we also hear from God, you are my child, you are my beloved son, my beloved daughter, you are the one that I delight in. And I think probably for most of us, Probably most of the time, we don't hear that. What we hear is some other voice that's spelling out a list of reasons why God can't love us yet. It's a kind voice. It's a voice that's saying, as soon as I'm doing this, as soon as I quit doing that, and surely by next year I'll be ready. And it has hope, but it doesn't think that God loves us quite yet that God doesn't delight in us, that when God thinks of each one of us, it doesn't bring a smile to his face. And that's why this baptism of John, of Jesus by John, is so important to our Christian life because there is a theological problem here and it's precisely in that problem that we find an answer that helps us the problem, of course, is why is Jesus being baptized? John is in the River Jordan baptizing people for the repentance of sin. Jesus is the saving son of God. He has no sin. So why is he going before John to be baptized for the repentance of sin? From the very beginning, this problem was noted by the apostles themselves and dealt with by theologians and by the fathers of the church in those early centuries who understood that the baptism of Jesus is all about us. It's the way that Jesus prepares the waters of baptism with power so that when you and I are baptized, that washing will have some effect. It's a way that Jesus is showing us his love before we were even born, certainly before we ever did anything that could merit it, to teach us that there is, in fact, nothing we can do to merit God's love. And yet, we have it. This is a really important um, truth for us to, to dwell on, to settle in, because it helps us to overcome the tendency that we have to hold God at arm's length and say, I'm going to be ready pretty soon. I'm almost there, God. You've been working on me. I go to confession regularly, and I'm almost ready for you to love me. Pretty soon I'll be there. But there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we could ever do. There never was anything that we could do. Jesus did not come to the earth after the human race had finally all agreed to obey God and was finally ready. Jesus came to the earth precisely in the midst of ongoing sin and degradation, which is a part of our nature as fallen human persons. He came to save us and to show us God's love when we didn't deserve it so that we could learn that we don't have to earn it. We can't earn it, so therefore we don't have to. So therefore we should simply let God love us. 
Now, what causes us to think that that we have to, or that this won't work, is because then it seems like, well, if God already loves us, then what motive do we have to become better? If I'm stuck in habitual sin, what motive do I have to break that habit of sin? If God already loves me completely, well, it answers itself, doesn't it? If God knows my name, if God loves me in a way that I can't even comprehend, if when God thinks of my name, it brings a smile to his face, then how could I not love him in return? St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote a whole treatise on this question. How could I not love God in return because God loved me first? And if I decide that because God has loved me first, I want to love him back, that will cause me to seek him out. That will cause me to desire to know what does he want me to do? Also importantly, what does he want me to avoid doing? And then I will have a motive to seek what God wants from me because I love him. And why do I love him? Because he already loves me first. So then sin and overcoming sin gets away from the motive of guilt and fear and anxiety and all of that and comes from an even stronger place, an even deeper place. God's love for me. He already loves me. Even though I am a sinner, He already loves me. And because He does, I'm going to seek His grace, His power in my life and in my prayer and strive to be holy because I want to love Him. This is the gift of our baptism I mean, after all, we were, most of us were babies, right? What did we do to earn baptism? We spit up a lot. We kept our parents up late. We, we cried a lot. Maybe we cut a few teeth. We didn't do much. And yet, God in his love saved us. God said to us, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter. In you I am already well pleased. And then as we come to realize that love, our response is, yes, Lord, teach me to do your will. 